Before we get to the, so there are two more questions, but I'd actually like to ask a slightly less or slightly more controversial question. So for the last eight years, we've been told that next year will be the year of the Linux desktop. And for the last eight years, the penetration figures of the Linux desktop have hovered in the zero to one percent region. First thing to the panel is, do you think next year will be the year of the Linux desktop? <laughs> and the second thing is, if not, why not? What is the problem? We'll start with oh, Ted. So next year will be the year of the Linux desktop, because next year is always uh, the <laughs> okay. year of the Linux desktop. <laughs> <I'll buy> that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's just the immutable rule. Um, <laughs> and at, at some level, it's not clear to me that that's actually all that useful of, of a question, right? And uh, the, the, the thing that's actually been much more interesting to me is whether or not someone who chooses to use Linux as their desktop uh, can do so in a relatively pain-free way. Uh, because in my mind, it should always be about choice. And I think to a large extent, that's now mostly true. Maybe there's a really, really specialized um, program that you know, you know, can only run on say Mac OS or something like that, um, or some other operating system. Um, but uh, in general, the combination of a lot of the most common things that you need being available for Linux, um, tools such as uh, KVM or Crossover Office allowing you to run other operating systems if you need to. And then the increased uh, amount of things that you do uh, in your browser, talking to uh, something like Google Docs or some other um, sort of uh, web services uh, application, um, I think is all the difference. And so therefore, at that point, I think we've hit at least my personal victory condition, which is I can use Linux on my desktop. And uh, you know, hopefully, I can help other people who want that, but I, I don't know that it's important that everyone or some substantively large percentage of uh, the you know, user population is using Linux as a desktop. And it's not clear that's ever going to happen. So the takeaway answers are basically, mm -hmm. there isn't a problem and I'm a bad moderator. <laughs> <laughs> so let's ask the audience, how many people have actually tried to use Linux on their desktop? <laughs> That's almost 100%, yeah. right? How many people use Linux as their primary machine on their desktop? <laughs> that's about 60%, I think. So the observation basically is that more people are using Linux than I think. And actually, I have to say from my point of view, Linux has been my desktop operating system for 10 years, and I still haven't had any trouble with it. I think I've been told we have time for one more question. We might stretch to, so we might not get to you. Hang on. Yeah, you. Uh, how's the way the kernel development process uh, interacts with the Linux standards base changed over the last year or two? And what, if anything, is likely to change going forward? Uh, oh, should I take that one? Well, you are the LSB yeah. guy. So, uh, so you can give the, yeah. the, for the court, and we'll take someone against the court later. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so I mean, the, the kernel doesn't actually really impact the Linux standard base, because the Linux standard base has primarily been more about uh, uh, user space ABIs. And the kernel has always had a fairly, number one, a fairly stable ABI. Number two, it's buffered um, by uh, shared libraries, most notably glibc. Um, I will note that uh, fairly recently, the LSB tests uh, did turn up uh, a regression in the TTY layer. Um, but that was mainly because we had sucked in um, some um, POSIX compliance tests. Uh, and so we noticed that one of the TermIOS bits wasn't actually uh, doing what the standard said it was supposed to do, and that was because uh, uh, someone who was trying to clean up the TTY layer accidentally screwed up. Um, so it's useful as a regression test suite, but otherwise they've never really impacted each other in, uh, in the past, and I don't expect that it would in the future. 
Anybody else care to take the question of the relevance of the LSB to the kernel? That patch got sent from me to Linus. It's in there now. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fixed. <laughs> okay, one last question. I should have said that. It's okay. Yes. You, you can, Steve Rosted can ask it after, because <laughs> you're not mailing list shy. So in the past few years, there have been several user space driver frameworks make it into the kernel uh, fuse, and there's a character one just recently made it in. One of the claims of those was to reduce primarily future kernel bloat by, I mean, Fuse has been a great example how many experimental file systems haven't gone in because of that. Um, but what about actually now taking the opportunity that they're there and relatively stable to actually remove some of the historical bloat? You don't actually want to do drivers or file systems in the user space. It's wonderful for doing prototyping. And it's wonderful for doing really odd specialized hardware. Like I, I think, that, I mean, the USB people have always done uh, certain drivers in user space. They, they used libUSB and they did their scanners all in user space. And, and that's where it works fine. And it has worked fine historically. Uh, do, doing things like QSA and FUSA to do file systems in user space makes sense. Uh, I, one of the big users of Fusa is uh, the iPhone file system thing, right? Well, I don't know if it's a big user, but it's kind of a good example of something that is very specialized and has no performance issues because <laughs> it's going to be slow anyway. And it's, it's this one very specialized device. It has no long-term life outside of that device. Then a user space file system makes sense. But anything else, it's great for prototyping. But you certainly would not want to take an existing kernel file system and then move it into user space. That would just be crazy. I mean, that's, that's LSD trippy kind of thinking. <laughs> it's, uh, don't do that. It's actually, a lot of the time, it gets way harder to debug. We are moving things into the kernel out of user space because of issues like that, where uh, doing kernel mode setting and doing a lot more of the logic of graphics in kernel space actually makes it easier for everybody because now you don't have two broken pieces that don't have a clue what the other piece is doing and, uh, and trying to debug across that kind of divide is horrible. Uh, so the debugging advantages of doing thing drivers in user space have always been kind of suspect. I don't think it's really been true, except in very early kind of bring up uh, meaning. But now people can do. You can do block device drivers in user space. You can do character device drivers in user space. You can do file systems in user space. Go wild. I mean, we, <laughs> it, it's not, I think, relevant for any major file system or driver, but, but it's it's there if you want to. So the now boss. Greg can disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll have, we, we're running out of time, but we'll have a brief disagreement if you can contain it to 10 words. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ikea and robot welding Linux robots. <laughs> no, laser welding robots. So, so Greg no. has a real-time example. Yeah, of we have real-time PCI devices running real-time laser welding robots. Talk to Thomas Gleixner about those. Oh, um, so but they're fun. It can be done. Um, again, those are not general purpose things. So, so the general takeaway from this is don't always listen to the man in the middle. <laughs> um, with that, we're out of time for questions. So if there was anything that you wanted to hear in this session that you didn't hear, it was your fault for not asking the questions. <laughs> and I'd like to thank all of our panel. That's John, Chris, Linus, Ted, and Greg. Thank you very much. <laughs>